الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters let's return to our discussion about zakah and about the inner dimensions of giving we talked about how being reluctant to depart with one's money is really stupidity because how is it possible that one is reluctant to depart with a single coin in order to get thousands more. In reality, brothers and sisters, everything that we spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an investment. It is something we spend and we will find thousands and thousands of times more than what we have spent waiting for us when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And this intention or this desire or this hope, this aspiration that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us for our sadaqah in the akhirah is something much better than merely trying to give your money to purge yourself of miserliness or giving money in order to get more. So alhamdulillah, whichever way you view it brothers and sisters, subhanallah, there's no justification really for us being reluctant to spend money in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also the attitude of looking down on the person who is receiving the sadaqah, this is also in reality a sign of ignorance. And if one really recognized the superiority of poverty over wealth and the danger of wealth and the danger of being rich, then you would not despise the poor. Rather, you would look for their blessing and you would wish that you were at their level. Because the Prophet wasallam said that even the righteous amongst the rich will enter paradise 500 years after the poor brothers and sisters. So this is why the Prophet wasallam is reported to have said that by Allah they are the greatest of losers. And Abu Dhar, he asked, who are the greatest of losers, messenger of Allah? And he said, those with the most wealth. Of course, except those who spend that wealth in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point being, brothers and sisters, with wealth comes many problems. With wealth comes many tests. With wealth, unfortunately, often comes a feeling of being self-sufficient, of not needing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of arrogance, of pride. All of these things come, unfortunately, with wealth. And you find, subhanAllah, that most of the people who followed the prophets were actually from the poor and the weak people. Whether you look at the story of Nuh alayhi salam, when you look at the Bani Israel, when you look at many of the stories of the prophets, you find that even in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, barring a few exceptions, most of the people who followed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam were the weak and the poor and the deprived people in society. This is because that condition or that state of poverty causes a person to recognize and to realize their great need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if one recognizes all of that, then one would be very, very far from looking down upon and despising the poor people. How is it, brothers and sisters, that we would despise a group of people or one would despise some people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made for the rich people a source of their own profit. In reality, brothers and sisters, why should we even strive to gain wealth? One of the reasons that you should strive to gain wealth is in order to be able to spend it in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on those poor and needy people. So one is obliged to hand over one's wealth 
to the poor people in accordance with their needs and without holding any surplus that would be detrimental to yourself. So in a sense, brothers and sisters, the rich are gainfully employed in providing for and helping the poor. This is one of the gainful means of employment, the useful things that the rich can actually do is helping to look after the poor people. SubhanAllah. So in a sense, you can look at it is that poor people give rich people a purpose a reason to have wealth. So if we understand all of these things, inshallah ta'ala, a person will be very, very far from looking down and thinking in a bad way about the poor and the needy people. So in reality, brothers and sisters, this wealth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon us, we are not going to take it with us to our graves. It is going to be left behind for our inheritors. The only things that we're going to take with us to our grave are our deeds, our good deeds and our bad deeds. So in reality, brothers and sisters, the money that we spend in the path of Allah, that money we spend on the poor and the needy and in charity, that is something that is going to be made permanent because we will find that and the benefit of that waiting for us when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the money that we leave behind that is the money that truly we have in reality lost. Now, it's only when this reluctance to spend is transformed into joy and gladness, being helped by Allah to pay one's due and to discharge one's obligation through its acceptance by the poor, then there is no more hurtfulness and scolding and frowning. Instead, brothers and sisters, the person's attitude is replaced with happiness, appreciation, and gratitude. Now there's a very good test to apply to yourself to understand if you really think of yourself as the benefactor. Do you really think that you are the benefactor? Here's a test that you can apply to really see whether you think in that way or not when you're giving charity. Imagine that this poor person committed an offense against you. So this poor person did something to upset you or he teamed up with someone who is an enemy to you. Now, would your disapproval of this person's action be increased because you had given this person charity? If that is the case, in other words, if you'd be more upset and more disappointed because you gave that person charity, that is an indication that you think of yourself as the benefactor. You think of yourself as, I am the one who has improved this person's condition. I am the one who gave him this money. So this person did this to me and he did that to me. And on top of that, I gave him charity. So in reality, this is a test to show that in reality, your attitude is still really a bad attitude. You're still thinking of yourself as the benefactor. So this is a type of test you can apply to see whether you're giving charity, you're giving sadaqah, your giving zakah is really, really subhanAllah pure or not. And we think of that example of Abu Bakr when Aisha was slandered and there was a relative that he used to give regular charity to and subhanAllah he and that relative actually was involved in subhanAllah the slandering of Aisha. So Abu Bakr subhanAllah stopped giving him charity. But Allah said that wouldn't you love that Allah would forgive you? Wouldn't you love even if you made mistakes and you did wrong things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would continue to help you? So again, it shows that we should think of ourselves as subhanAllah, we're just the means through whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is transferring provision to another person. We shouldn't think of ourselves as being the benefactor in that respect. Now you may think brothers and sisters, nobody is free from such a thing. Nobody is free from such thoughts. Maybe you think you need something more practical. And even if this is the case, and I do feel like that, what is the remedy? How can I change that state within myself? And how can I cure this way of behaving? Well, it does have a remedy. And the remedy is both an external remedy and an internal remedy. So let's talk about it. The internal remedy is basically to become conscious of the things that we have already mentioned. 
So all of these things that we have already been mentioning about the superiority of the poor people over the rich people, the fact that you are a conduit for the risk, the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the charity goes into the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before it goes into the hand of the poor person or the person receiving all of these things that we have been talking about is to remind yourself of these things to be aware of them and to understand them so this is to be conscious of these truths as one of the ways that you will remedy that situation and the other thing of course is to understand the importance and the necessity of giving zakah and alms giving and coming to see that the beneficiary, the real beneficiary, is the person who is giving the charity. The one who is really benefiting is yourself. And when you do that, and when you think like that, this will enable you to rid yourself of these false type of notions. Now as for the external remedy, this consists of doing particular deeds that if a person is prone to taunting and to saying bad things and behaving in a bad way to the person they're giving charity, there's certain things that you can do in order to change your behavior. And we'll talk more about that after the break, inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum brothers and sisters. Welcome back. We're continuing our discussion of what remedy can you apply in order to rid yourself of this bad attitude of taunting and admonishing and behaving in a bad way and having a bad attitude and a wrongful type of attitude towards the people to whom you are giving charity. So what we have mentioned is that there are some actions that you can perform inshallah ta'ala and these actions will help to rid you of this bad attitude. So just simple things like for example some people used to place the arms or place the charity in front of the poor man and stand before him as if they were the one who was begging. So it's almost they were pleading and begging with that poor person to accept the charity from them. This is just an action. You see brothers and sisters, we've mentioned this before that the way that you behave, the actual actions that you do they actually affect the way that you feel and the way that your heart is. So adopting this humble position before a person who is poor and who is accepting the charity in the sense that you are the one who is pleading and begging with that person to accept your charity. Then you put yourself in the position of the one who is in need, not thinking about that person as if they're the needy one. No. You need them in order to accept your charity. So this is a type of action that you could do. So for example, they would spread their palms like this. So the charity was in the palms. And so the person who is taking their hand would be uppermost. Because yes, the Prophet Wasallam did, of course, discourage begging. He did discourage begging. And the Prophet Wasallam said that the upper hand is better than the lower hand, meaning the one that is giving is better than the one that is receiving. So what some people used to do is they used to make the charity lower so the person who is taking would take it from above. So they wouldn't do the action of giving, they would make it as if they are the ones who are begging. So it's the same idea but it's just an action a way of behaving outwardly that causes that person who is giving the charity to actually create a condition in their heart as if they are really the ones who are begging and they are the ones who are in need and they are the ones who need that person to take the charity from them. So this is subhanAllah you can see a beautiful way to create within yourself a really good attitude towards giving to look at yourself as being the needy one, not to look at the person who's receiving your charity as being the needy one. Also, subhanAllah, you find that Aisha and Umm Salma, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them, they used to send a gift to a poor person by means of a messenger. And they would ask that messenger to memorize 
the person's good wishes. So for example, a person will often say, may Allah bless you and such and such and this and that and mention compliments and things like that. So they would ask this messenger to memorize those things that the person said. And when the person said those things, they would wish the same back to them. Now why would they do that? Because they didn't want their charity and their sadaqah to be corrupted and to be marred by the idea that a person may wish them good. The point being here is that sometimes people may give charity because they want a person to compliment them and to say good things about them and so on and so forth. But they wanted their charity, their sadaqah to be completely pure and to be completely free from those things. Brothers and sisters, it's just amazing to think how subhanallah these companions of the Prophet, the wives of the Prophet, how they thought so deeply about trying to make their actions as pure and as sincere as possible for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they could represent a type of compensation for giving the charity. And you find Umar ibn al-Khattab, he had the same practice. So brothers and sisters, try to adopt this type of mentality try to make sure that your charity it is as pure as possible sincerely and entirely for Allah and that you're not seeking from it any type of praise or any type of fame or any type of gratitude that you're just doing this completely and sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so as for remedying these diseases or this wrong thinking in the heart in respect to poor people there is no real remedy for this through external actions except these type of things that we have to zakah. It's very interchangeable, alhamdulillah. But we are concentrating on this ritual, the prescribed act of worship, which is giving the zakah. And as we have already mentioned, there are certain categories of people who fall, who have been mentioned in the Quran, who are the ones who are deserving of receiving the zakah. Now, perhaps I could just, for example, find some charity or some organization. That's what most of us will do. And we will give our money to that organization and they will distribute the sadaqah or the charity for us. However, brothers and sisters, it is better to make an effort to try and find people who are really, really deserving of this sadaqah. And there are certain types of people to whom giving this sadaqah will certainly, inshallah ta'ala, be more beneficial than just distributing it to anybody who just happens to fit that category. So, inshallah, let's talk about some of these categories of people. Firstly, the first group of people, of course, that we should think about giving are pious people. People who have, subhanAllah, renounced the world and the things of this world, they have devoted themselves to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to concentrating on the business of the Akhirah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the general hadith, told us that only eat the food of a pious man and only give your food or only share your food with a pious person. So this is not an absolute command in the sense that one should never give food to anyone except the pious. But this is a general advice that when you're going to eat with someone, eat with a pious person. When you're going to share your food with someone, share with a pious person because the benefits and the advantages that are going to accrue to yourself from that are much, much greater. So the reason is, brothers and sisters, obviously that your food will support that pious person in their worship and you then will become a beneficiary you will share in the benefit you will share in his worship since you have supported it you have helped to sustain it this is similar to what we have mentioned previously when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that whoever encourages a person or whoever supports a person in a righteous action then they will get the reward of that person acting upon that without that person's reward being diminished in the least. So we should offer our food to the pious 
and favor the believers with your kindness and in another version we find treat your food to those whom you love in God exalted is he so again brothers and sisters just to re-emphasize this important point is that be a little bit careful think about who are the people who are benefiting from your sadaqah the people who are most worthy to benefit from your sadaqah are of course the pious people the righteous people alhamdulillah so a second group of people is very similar to the first are the people who are the students of knowledge so the next group of people are the students of knowledge and the students of learning so if we can help them and provide them of course we will help in the study of knowledge and learning and the spreading of ilm and inshallah we've come to the end of this particular episode but we will continue this discussion next time inshallah in the meantime brothers and sisters remember to implement and to act upon what you have learned in this episode until next time assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh